Hi everyone, my name is Kurt Bachman and welcome back to The Ultimate Dish. Today I have the great pleasure of speaking with a truly inspiring guest, the K. E.J. Wyrie, a Scafia graduate and founder of Beck's Culinary Academy in Lagos, Nigeria. The K. isn't your typical culinary expert. She's a chartered accountant who has seamlessly blended her financial acumen with her deep-seated passion for cooking and baking. With a successful career developing recipes and managing cakes and more, which is a lunch, a school lunch business located in Nigeria, she decided to take a bold step and establish Beck's Culinary Academy in 2021. Bekay's vision extends far beyond just running a culinary academy. She's on a mission to elevate the way we cook and revolutionize the culinary scene in Africa. She's also committed to raising awareness around gender equality and empowering women in the culinary industry. So buckle in as we dive in to Bekay's fascinating story, her vision for Beck's Culinary Academy, as well as the culinary landscape in Africa. And there she is. Good morning. Good morning, Craig. Wow. <laughs> You're beaming. You're yes, beaming. Yes, I'm exhausted because... from the intro. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was a fantastic intro. Thank you so much. And no, um, It's it's um... all you. You're the star of the show. You're the star of the show. It's so it's, good to see you. So good, good to, to see, see you. It's good to see you, too. I think it's a privilege to be here with you, Craig. Because um, <laughs> I only saw your name and signature written on all of the president's, um, <laughs> I was on the president's list. Yes, yes. All of the yes. semesters. So I never thought I would meet you in person. And then today we're here. <laughs> to just talk, to just talk. And there's so much, so much to talk about. You're, mm. you're actually in Atlanta. Um um, going back home to Nigeria later this month, um, and if if you're okay, I'm going to say congratulations because you're a grandma. Yes, <laughs> thank you. How is um, your beautiful grandchild? And um, she's doing very well. Her name is Isabella Becker, Isabella. by the way. Oh, of course, of course. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so that was um, a really surprising, that was a really nice thing for my daughter to do, you know. I yeah. felt truly honored. And um, yes, I've, I've been in Atlanta for a while. I actually arrived the United States in October. For graduation. For the, thank you. <laughs> For the Escofier graduation ceremony in Boulder, you remember we met physically and I mean, it was an awesome day. <laughs> and then I, I, I do remember I said to you how Escofier allowed me to find my culinary voice. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, one of the reasons I'm so excited this morning is because we are actually sitting together and I'm speaking, so my, my voice is going to be heard. So yes, it is. To... <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it, it it is. And we have so much to talk about. Um, I wanted to mention too. I'm I'm on your Instagram page quite a bit, and it's at Bex Cookery, uh, by the way. Yes. And it, it, you are so natural. I have to say, on Thank the you. camera, your your charisma, your um, you know, just love and passion is really contagious. So you you have you can't upstage me today, okay? Uh, <laughs> otherwise, otherwise, Noel's gonna get a new host for the show, and it's gonna be Bacay. <laughs> no, I have to set the stage for all of our listeners. Noel okay. doesn't know that I'm gonna do this, but um, it's it's important, and it sets the tone for how we met each other. Um, you first reached out to me from Nigeria on September 6th of last hmm. year. And um, I, I probably read your email 10 times and then I read it to other people. Um, and, and you shared your observations, your comments and your recommendations for our world cuisine class, specifically around the cuisine, the food culture and the cuisine of Africa. And your comments were so, they were so relevant, right? They were so poignant, so polite. And so mm -hmm. helpful. Mm -hmm. um, you you enlightened us around, how should I say, your personal experiences and knowledge um, around, it's just a few topics. You The, the fact that Nigeria and most of West Africa um, in, in, in that region, that soups and rice 
are are major staples. You talked about uh, fufu soup, is that right? Which is made yes. from yams, cassava, yes. or, or 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 plantains, right? <laughs> yes. You, you also discussed in your note to me that women in uh, Burkina Faso have been making beer for yeah. some five thousand years. Mm -hmm. You you talked to me about. Um, in Tanzania, that both the women and the men uh, participate in the harvest, and they they also brew different sorts of beers. You you went on to share information about Malawi in East Africa, and mm -hmm. I, I think my biggest takeaway from our interaction back then, well, number one was it was very extremely helpful for us to enhance our curriculum to really focus uh, not just on the cuisine of Africa. I, I think my my takeaway was that using the term Africa as an umbrella for all cuisine in Africa is probably a mistake because there are so many cultures and and different cuisines throughout all of Africa, and and and, and that was very very enlightening to me. And 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 and, and I'll say also that. In our communication, you let me know then that you would be attending graduation in person with your husband in Boulder, and you did that, and it was such a joy to to tour you on the campus and 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 to be on stage with you and take photos. And um, your husband was so dressed up that night, um, that day. Can I just tell you, um, yes. <laughs> it, it's, it's just absolutely beautiful. But you know, can we spend just a little bit of time? With that as a backdrop for you to share a little of your passion about the cuisine of Africa, maybe maybe explore a little deeper what you were sharing with me a few months ago. Oh wow! Okay, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, it, it's actually I, that mail was that email to you was a follow up to my experience during the world cuisine class that we mm -hmm, took mm -hmm. when I was on this um, journey. And um, it was saddening, saddening to note that um, Africa was put under an umbrella, you know. We've had to, oftentimes, when my kids were back in high school, the school had to do a program, a yearly program that was termed Africa is not a country. You know, okay. so yeah, it's taken from there. While I sat in class that day, we cooked meals from Africa. We, I, I said, wow, there's a need to let people know that they can put us all under the same umbrella, even in the world of food, even in the culinary world, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that. It, it, it's it interesting that most of us do share similar staples. You know, we, we all do the grains, we do the beans. You know, some of us, like in West Africa, we do a lot of rice and yams, you know. And we, of course, do, we use the smoking technique to cook, the stewing technique and fermentation. You know, it goes on and on. There are such similarities, you know. But some of us do not pay in the past, okay, now here's the second thing. I think the, the course we had dwelt a bit on what happened in the past, you know? So I think there's a need to, you could do like a throwback and mention, oh, in the past, X, Y, and Z could happen in A, B, and C places in Africa. But now, this is how we have embraced cooking and this is how we cook, you know? So I think that all through Africa, we need to highlight the different spices that we use. In Nigeria, for instance, we have a very unique um, flavor profile, you know? We would do the iru blended with the um, scotch bonnet peppers. We mm. call them rodo. Okay, and some crawfish that would basically form a unique spice profile for our soups, you know. And then we would we would roast our plantains. We can season before we roast. We can season with pepper. We can season with salt, you know. And some people 
like it really, really spicy. So we kind of provide alternatives. You can do mildly spiced, you can do medium spice, you can do, you know, really hot spices. So I just figured that talking to you about it should throw, we should throw more light on how we cook in Africa, you know, the different ways that is different from one country to the other. Of course, we do not expect to have food from all of the countries put in one place, you know, but Africa can be split up into four main categories. You can do the East, the West, the North, you know, and of course the Southern part of Africa. Well, and, and, and I appreciate that and know too that once once our episode airs, it'll be pushed out to all of our faculty and our students. So um, what, what's beautiful about this sort of connection that we have is that um, it provides a channel for, for knowledge, for sharing of information um, across, across different sectors of people that come from all around you know, the country and the world. We, we should talk a minute about um, your your perspectives on the cuisine of the south, uh, the southeast of the United States, being in Atlanta for the last several months. Oh, are you are you a fan or are you struggling? <laughs> okay, now um, how do I say this? I I haven't had too many opportunities to explore the okay. cuisine in Atlanta. I must confess, you know, the <laughs> most I've done was. Um, to go to the Pond City Market, okay. and I had a Mexican meal. I don't really think that counted, you know. <laughs> but um, the other day I had a tacos, and it was quite nice, you know. And I did enjoy it. And, and you asked um, how I spent my time through this season. I actually decided to run an online class, okay, and I promised my students almost 100 recipes. So I've been so, so busy cooking. Oh my I cook gosh. so much. I had no idea. Yes. If you're working so, the whole time that you're yes, doing as yes, well. Yes, yes. My so, goodness. I mean, I really didn't have time to go out and explore the cuisine in Atlanta. <laughs> but you're still cooking, but you're still yeah. cooking. Yes. You, you know, we should take this opportunity, Bikay, to... Um, as you know, as I said at the top of the show, your story is fascinating. Your personality is electric. Let's let's go Thank back you. to the very beginning and let's talk about you a little bit. What was what was your childhood like growing up? And did your cuisine play an important role in your family unit? Um, what type of meals were served when you were growing up? And then I guess to wrap all that up. Did you always envision yourself starting a career in the culinary arts to share your knowledge with others? How did it all come about? <laughs> Growing up was a very happy place. <laughs> you know? So um, I was in this small family unit, just my mom and my siblings. I have three siblings, you know. Okay. And we grew up in Benin City where it's... <laughs> we lived on this um, street where every family knew each other, you know? Yes, so it, yes. it was the typical space where you would say it takes a village to grow, to groom a child. That's the kind of setting I grew up in, you know? So you would often find us outside playing. So we, we had a lot of outdoor activities. And then because my mom was a head teacher, she she actually had this mantra that um, the devil finds work for the idle hands. So, <laughs> so she would often keep us occupied with board games. So I actually okay. grew up playing a lot of board games like Scrabble, Monopoly, chess, you know, <laughs> and then um, we had this local game called Ayo. You know, Ayo um, has some round um circles on a board and it has round seats and you just go round and round and then whatever you determine the winner after a certain <laughs> number of rounds you know yes that that's the setting i grew up in and then um, what we 
what we ate was actually not too different from what we eat today. We, we ate the same rice, although at that time rice would occur perhaps on Sundays and then sometimes twice a week, you know. What's different now is that you can actually eat rice every day in the, yeah, yeah. you know, so that's different. So we had rice, we had yam, we had the fufu, we had the staples, we had, you know. And um, it's interesting, my mom, because she she could cook, you know. <laughs> she, oh, so could, she was a good cook. She was a yes, good cook. she was yeah. she was a good cook, you know, yeah. and um, it was always fantastic looking forward to dinner time, to lunch. And one um major thing about her was she allowed us to eat what we wanted, especially <laughs> me. <laughs> especially me, because I was a precious were you a, child. Were you a difficult child? Were you a difficult not at child? all? Not at all. <laughs> not at all. I was actually easygoing. I, I was yeah. her last child. As you are now. Yeah. I was yeah. the baby of the family, you know. Okay. Yeah. And it, it's funny, my diet actually revolved around plantains, okay. rice, bread and margarine you know those yes. were basically the things i would eat so if i should come home after school and there's no plantain oh my goodness it's like <laughs> i'll <laughs> cry i'll yeah. cry and my mom would have to provide <laughs> plantain you know so yeah that's how i grew up <laughs> and when and when did when did this idea of you because well let's just go forward to um, where you studied, you you studied accounting yes. at uh, uh, at a university in Nigeria. Yes. Was culinary on your mind before that, or did it come about a little bit later? Oh my goodness, no! So <laughs> at that it, time in Nigeria, you you could every parent wanted their child to be a professional in terms sure, of sure. you had to study medicine, law, um, engineering, accountancy, you know, those were the go-to professionals. And life was such that you finished high school, you must go to university and you must be a doctor or an accountant or a lawyer, you know? So we, we didn't, we actually, we are trained to fulfill those expectations. So if you were good in math, like I was, I was lucky, I, I was good in math and I loved mathematics. I loved economics. And um, when I did the basic accounting, I really enjoyed it, you know? So naturally I moved into university and I studied accounting, so, you know? So that was how I got into studying accounting. Now, I, have the privilege of hindsight and i would say to you that as young as seven years old i used to play cooking games you know kind of yeah. like a make-believe that i was a chef and then <laughs> i'd actually take some sand and stones and um, wild growing plants cut them up create a cooking pot with tins you know there were these tins um, that we bought with evaporated milk. So once the milk is used, I save all of those things because those become my cooking pots. You know? <laughs> and so when I think back, I'm like, oh my goodness, it's like you had it running in your veins, you know? So and yeah, that's yeah. what I'll spend a lot of time doing, just make believe. And then, but by the time I got to um, high school, I, 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 for some reason, I love to bake. You know, my mom had this old, like a cookery book. So I, I'll take it, go through the recipes. And we actually didn't have an oven, but I had a, a friend who had an oven in her home. I'll go there, you know, and I'll say, Kate, we need to bake, we need to bake. You know? <laughs> so <laughs> it's so funny. Years back, you know what Kate said to me? Kate said, well, Becky, you know, all of those days you used to come to my home to bake, we used to tease you a lot behind your back. Little did I know that it's going to be, you know, your oh profession goodness. and your business and you would earn good money from it. You know, so that's really how far back I, I got involved in cooking and baking. Now, we, <laughs> now we, well, we, we'll be sure to send your friend 
the recording of our little <laughs> chat here where she where she gets mentioned. Uh, who's making fun of who now, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, so eventually you decided to start your own school. Um, I'm just, I'm, I want to put a timeline around this. How, how long and, and how much did you enjoy working as a professional in the area of accounting? Was that something that was a, a big part of your life for many years? No, not at all. No, I actually, okay. yes, I, I, after my graduation from university, I went through, okay, so now this is how it works back home. For the accounting prof profession, we have a qualifying, a professional qualifying exams, which you need to pass before you become a chartered accountant. And okay. these, these exams are really competitive, you know? And yeah. um, so right after university, I actually met my husband, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and and within the year we decided to get married and so i knew one thing i had to do was pass my qualifying exams you know before sure, the wedding sure. anyway long story short i did pass my qualifying exams a few months after we got married okay, okay, okay. and being a chartered accountant um means uh, a career to build a career as a chartered accountant means you'd have to work in the banking sector or the oil industry you know to make the very best of it and that would take a lot of time so my husband and i decided we we wanted to be we wanted one of us to be home for our kids because we wanted to just make sure our kids got the best out of us, you know. And I am particularly not too keen on nine to five jobs anyway. Yeah. So <laughs> I opted to be that person to stay home, you know. So I actually started out my life being a stay-at-home mom. So while I was home, I took on baking and, um, <laughs> and cooking and it, it was amazing how after several years, there was a time I needed to be financially independent. You know, there was a lot going on and it was kind of stressful not being financially independent, you know? So I mentioned to a friend of mine that, oh my goodness, I wonder if this was the right decision because they were all rising in the banks. They were getting promoted and they were all looking great and they could afford so much, but I was, on the home front, you know, taking care of things. And she said to me, you know what, Becca, your cakes are really lovely to eat and you keep doing them for free. Why don't you make those cakes and we'll pay you for them? And that was actually how my cake business started off, you know, so I would bake and I get paid for them and my business grew. Now, many years down the line, I think, you know, sometimes you, you reach this play to where you seem to be bored, where it seems like, okay, I've seen it all. I've done all of this. I'm stressed out. What next? You know, so I had to do some self-reflection and I realized I enjoy teaching people. You know, I, I would tell my friends to bring their kids around during the holiday and I'll teach them how to bake, you know? So I said, wow, I think I'm going to love teaching people, I will have a cooking school, you know, but this is so many years back, like almost 20 years ago. And um, I rested that passion. I continued to grow my businesses, started off the school run business, then COVID happened. <laughs> as soon as COVID happened, oh my goodness, most of the businesses shut down and I was, sure. I was, bored you know I was just tired of sitting and my husband and I said oh this will be a good time you know to to put the foundation for a school together and actually do it formally and then um, 2021 we ruled out Beck's Culinary Academy. I love it and we're going to talk about that can I just say before we move into that that I I feel like I'm in a a lovely therapy session today. You're in My genuine, <laughs> your genuine enthusiasm and love of life and the the way you're a storyteller. I I literally could just sit here and listen all day long. So wow. so 
you can you can bill me. This is my therapy <laughs> session for the day. But you so that's funny. <laughs> so that could be your next career, right? So <laughs> so eventually, um, so we're around 2021 now, and you decided to start your own school in Nigeria called Cakes and More. And I love this on your website. No, no my business oh, that was before cakes, 21. My business, cakes and more. That's school lunches and birthday cakes. Okay. The culinary school, Beck's Culinary Academy. That came in 21. That yes. came in 21. Yes. And Cakes and More started when? 2003. Okay. So yes. long time, right? Long, long time. time. So <laughs> I, on your website, um, it says, and I quote, this is, this is your quote. It is always a joy to see faces light up when we arrive with our branded bags. We source wholesome, fresh ingredients and cook from scratch in our hygienic studio kitchen. Through feedback and research, we have developed a kid-friendly menu, which provides options to enable each child to eat exactly what they want. And you said that earlier, that's how you grew up. Yes. Your mother allowed you and your siblings to eat Precisely. exactly what you want. <laughs> Can you tell me, tell me a little bit more about the branded bags? Oh, okay. So what we actually do, we cook at our location, and then we have to portion the meals into little bowls, keep them covered, and then we deliver in the schools. Okay. okay? okay. So over time, we notice that the food will often get cold before the kids receive their meal. So we had to do a little bit of research, and we got some, the, just the regular cooler bags, the, and we got small individual ones, branded them. So every day we would have to tag each meal. We tag okay. each meal with the child's name, place them in the bag, zip up and deliver. So that's where the food stays warm for a longer period of time. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and so, um, gosh, there's so much to talk about here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Beck's and, and, and maybe even if you, because there'll be some entrepreneurs, students who want to be entrepreneurs that'll listen to this. What sort of challenges, let's talk about Beck's. What sort of obstacles or challenges did you have to overcome to start a culinary academy? And then if you could, Vicky, also talk, was your mother entrepreneurial in any way? What, what, like, where does this come from? Are your siblings entrepreneurial as well? Yes. Yeah. Straight up, yes. You know, okay. I, I, I did mention my mom was a head teacher. Yeah. But on this side, she was actually a seamstress. Okay. And she would create these beautiful attires using, um, um, what is it called? You use uh, uh, patterns, using patterns. Sure, okay? sure. And um, she was well sought after, but she she did it as a hobby. So she would take her time. And she, in that aspect, yes, she was an entrepreneur, although she didn't grow it into a bigger business, you know, but she did spend time doing that. And all of my siblings actually are entrepreneurs. My brother is a medical doctor, but he chose to build a hospital back home in Nigeria because, I mean, I think at heart, every human being can be an entrepreneur. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because, yeah. But you said you said it earlier. Some sometimes some of this runs in your veins, right? So <laughs> it's in the DNA. So. It's it's fascinating. Um, so were were there obstacles from the community or finances or just the need for a school that you had to overcome as an entrepreneur? Yes, you you remember my desire to to have a cooking school dates as far back as twenty years ago. Yeah. You know, and when I realized I had that desire. I was excited and the first thing I did was try to put a plan together, you know, like a business plan. And I approached a bank. I had a friend who was highly placed in one of the banks because you look towards getting some financial 
facility from the bank, right? Mm -hmm. And then we had a conversation and I explained, you know, you know, the, the excitement of a would-be entrepreneur, you know, I told him all of mm -hmm. the facts and all of the gains and, and he looked at me when I finished, he looked at me and he said, hmm, Becky, I'm not sure that's a business that's going to yield enough profits, you know? I was shocked. I said, why not? He said, because in our present environment, we do not have enough, um, <laughs> oh God, we do not have enough, what's it called? Um, guidance, Jamea. no, policies. Oh, we do not policies. have enough policies okay. guiding the food industry, okay. you know, the okay. food industry was not particularly regulated, you know, so yeah. it thought it would be a bit, a, a bit risky to put a lot of money into building a school at that time. So my initial challenge was the funding, okay? Sure, sure. And then... Um, Fortunately, moving forward, we are in such a good place now in the culinary industry in my country. We do have regulations in place, especially in terms of food safety and hygiene. You know, the yeah, yeah. hospitality industry is, is blooming, you know, and there is a demand. There's a demand for professionals you know so now the narrative has changed because you can confidently tell a young man or a young woman to go get a culinary degree because the gains are many financial gains are good you can set up your own business you can be a chef tutor and you'll be so satisfied you know you you <laughs> <laughs> you derive so much pleasure from being a chef. Yes, yes, yes. How would you, I, I'm fascinated, how would you, Peke, define or, or describe the culinary scene in West Af Africa, for example, today? Wow. Vibrant. That's the first Vibrant. word that comes yes. to my mind. Vibrant, yes. um, exciting. It's... um. It's like it, it's it's like it's blown out, and yeah, people are yeah. realizing, oh my goodness, we have good food, we have delicious, food. we can we can do a lot of things with this, you know. So we've had a lot of young people get professional degrees, and they're, they they're running away with it. They, you know, it's it's magical. <laughs> you you should be the spokesperson for the country's culinary scene. You you know on your web on your web um, on your homepage. It says fostering love and peace through food. Absolutely love that, by the way. What can students, what can your students expect from your school when they attend your school? You said, you said while you've been away, you've been doing some online cooking for, um, for them. But in general, what are you trying to accomplish with your school? Okay. Thank you for that, Craig. Um... So in my school, we decided to start off small because I believe in adding building blocks after a solid foundation. So we actually have three short courses, okay? And okay. Um, so any student that comes to my school will expect to get knowledge on culinary foundations, you know, we'll, run through techniques and methods of working with ingredients. We'll run through health, safety, and hygiene. And then we would also teach them cake baking, pastry making, bread making, walk them through recipes that actually yield good results. You know, and we finish off with Nigerian cuisine. So that's really where we are at this time. For our students, we want to start from scratch. We want to give them the fundamental knowledge of how to be good chefs. We want them to go away confident 
that once they see any ingredient, they can identify the state it's in. Is this good? Is this usable? Will it be okay for human consumption? You know, they'll be able to tell what to do with that ingredient. You know, we give them that space to become creatives so they can express themselves through their cooking. That's what we do with students, with the adults who come to Beck Culinary, because we truly believe that when we cook for people, when we bake for people, a little bit of ourselves go into that, you know, to oh, show gosh, them yes. yeah. that we care, you know, because we believe in that at Bex, we use recipes. We use recipes that we have adjusted to make sure it meets the flavor profiles that our audience is expecting. And then we tell our students that the recipe is not the be it and be all of this game. The recipe is just a guideline, you know, to help you go through what you need to do, you know, to help you put your ingredients together, to help you make your mise en place, you know. And we teach okay. them the techniques that we guide them towards creating a perfect plate. So that is the word I use at Beck's Culinary. So every time you cook, you must produce a perfect plate. And what does it take? Yes, you have a recipe, you, 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 you do your preparation, you use the correct techniques, and with an ample amount of care, you definitely produce an excellent dish. Yeah. So beautifully said. Um, I don't know that Augusta Scoffier could have said it any better. It was, it's the exact philosophy that, uh, uh, that he spoke to and wrote about so many years ago. You, you can provide a foundation. You can help people understand the, the most appropriate techniques to apply to a variety of ingredients. But more than anything, um, don't be don't be bound um, or detained um, by by preconceived expectations. Right? Be creative. Express yourself. Your food. I love how you said. Um, that every dish that you create should be a part of you that you're sharing with your guest. I, it, it, it's, it's, it's so beautiful. I think there's a book in there somewhere, Bikay, that we need to start thinking about writing a book together, <laughs> together. Let's, let's, let's fast forward to 2022, which was a little bit after you started Bex. Um, and I'm just fascinated by this. I and mean, as if you weren't busy enough, you decided to make this huge decision and enroll at Escoffier um, and earned your diploma in culinary arts. And you've said this to me, you've written this, you've said that this immersive experience further solidified your expertise and expanded your culinary knowledge. So absolutely beautifully said. I'm just, um, as, as a truly genuine question, I'm just so curious why you chose we talked about it a little bit informally. What, two things. Why did you choose to go back to culinary school? Because you were because you were longing for information, more information to better yourself. And and how did you land upon Escoffier as the place that you wanted to be? <laughs> Very interesting question. So this actually <laughs> takes us back to early February, 2022, okay? okay? So I I had to come to the US for, to be with my kids. My kids actually school in the US, you know? So sometimes I do come in to visit them. And um, I, was, I was intent on improving my skills. I, I actually didn't have, the plan to do a culinary degree. All I wanted to do was a short course, maybe a week, two weeks on food plating. You know, that was all I wanted to do because I figured, my goodness, I can cook, I can, 
I can bake, you know, I can decorate cakes. Who needs to go to culinary school, you know? So let me just add on a food plating course, you know, and I, I felt that would be a breeze and it wouldn't take any time. So I began to search for places where I could do that. But somehow, most of the things that popped up were restaurants, you know, advertising one day classes, you know, maybe coming to do some pasta, coming to do some, mm -hmm. you know, just one day classes. And then what I saw Escofia, it kept popping up anytime I searched Google. So I decided to call Escofia. <laughs> I actually <laughs> took time. I went on your website. I looked through. I couldn't really find any short-term courses. I filled out the form, you know, and I called. I spoke to someone called Jeremy at that time. I was like, okay, fine. I know a lot of these things, but I like to do menu design, you know. I like to, you know, experience all of these other portions of um culinary you know fine i know how to do my accounting and all of that but how about being taught specifically how it's done in the culinary world you know because i would not experienced that i just did it from my general knowledge of accounting so i called escofia back and i enrolled <laughs> love it i love it i love it are there any are there any specific other than, of course, um, us meeting in Boulder. But are there any other fond memories that you have of your experience um, over those 15 months? Yes, yes. Um, I remember particularly at the beginning, you know, we, we had to do the orientation and they had the spotlight challenges. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um <laughs> And I wanted to be spotlighted. I'm and sure. I got, I'm sure. I got spotlighted. You got spotlighted. I'm <laughs> yes. not surprised. I'm and, not surprised. You know, all. on the Mission Plus, and I think on the breakfast one as well, you know, it, I was super, super excited, you know, and I beat my chest and I was like, oh my goodness, I've got it in me. <laughs> You know, that, that really, really spurred me on, you know, it, it it made me want to do more and more. I loved those challenges. Yes, those were, those were some highlights, you know, that kept me going. And um, we had this chef, I really liked Chef Shante, Shanta, yeah, Shanta. And um, she, she would say, as far as it all goes, so many times, you know. So anytime I tune tune into class for the first two weeks, I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm going to grow mad. She's going to say, as far as it all goes again, you know. And funny enough, by the fifth week, I found myself saying, as far as it all goes. <laughs> you know, so those were cool moments, you know. We we've kept in touch. Chef Shante and oh, I, yeah. and yes, we've kept oh, I in love touch. It. I love it. That class was really exciting. Yes, yeah. those were fun moments. Have you been? Have you seen that you've been able to um, enhance or implement some of what you learned through your program for your current business? Oh yes, yes, yes. Yeah. First yeah. off, yeah. what comes to mind is. Um, labeling we did that um when we did culinary foundations um and we did fabrication where we had to fabricate the chicken right so the chef put us through labeling i found that really useful because we had to label them by parts you know we put the legs together the ties together and then we put the dates we put the dates, we'll keep them, and we use them as needed. I found it really useful because now we use the FIFO method, first in, first out. So as soon yes. as we label back in my business, we go through that process, you know. So that is definitely one thing <laughs> that I took away. I and love then, that. I love yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, very then, important, right? Just mm -hmm. from a sanitation and inventory um, control perspective. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. 100%. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so something else that comes to mind is um, the externship program. I think it's an excellent program because at first I didn't want to do the externship. I actually spoke to a chef about it. I'm like, okay, I have my own place. Can't I just do my externship hours there? But I was told no, that I needed to go somewhere else to fill in those hours, you know? Mm -hmm. So I had to do, that was the last semester, you know? Yep, so yep. I reached out to one of the most prestigious hotels in the city I live, you know, and they took me on as an extern. It was, it was such an amazing experience, you know. Of course, I'm not um, as young as some of the people they have in their kitchens, right? So I get in there and everyone is so polite oh madam no oh, madam don't oh, ma and oh, i'm like no. i want to do this i need to do this so you know what they did to me <laughs> so the butcher now comes to show me how to you know when you want to do the lollipop chicken so you mm. need to cut up the wing and push it down push it like sure, right sure. down so he showed me how to do it and i did a couple of them and he said here do them. He gave me a bag, a full bag of chicken wings. <laughs> and I'm like, my word. Okay. So I started doing it. You know, he didn't know the stuff I was made of, you know, that I'm resilient. And after I'd done like half of the bag, he comes back. He said, no, no, ma, you need to stop. Is enough. I said, no, I'm nope, going nope. to finish it. <laughs> you know, so the extension, and I finished it. And I think I... With that alone, I made my mark in the kitchen and they, they, they started to listen to me. They looked up to me and we worked together very well because they figured, oh my goodness, she can do some hard work, you know? And I was able to build a network of chefs in the industry without Escofia insisting on that extensive experience. I would still be a lone ranger, so to speak, you know, but now I have this array of chefs behind me that I can call upon at any one time and um, they'll come and we can work together. We've been exchanging ideas. We've kept in touch. It's, we've exchanged recipes and know-how. Sometimes I'll call them, oh, I want to prepare this Thai dish, you know, what next? And that's it. So the, the externship experience is an excellent one. It, it has worked well for me, you know? And then finally, I think there's one more thing. Oh my goodness, the passion the passion of the Escofia chefs. I think they've infused some of it in me because you guys are so passionate about seeing your students succeed. And that's such a good thing, you know? So I've adopted the same approach. I want my students to succeed and I go out of my way to help them. I encourage them. I give them the tools they need. I give them the advice they need. I keep in touch with them even after they've left, you know? So I think that passion I, I did get from working with your chefs, yes. I, I love it. I love it. And your enthusiasm is infectious. I, I, I just love it. Okay, you you mentioned in your, in your bio that your or I mentioned it at the beginning of the show, that you're passionate about empowering women in the culinary industry, which I find incredibly inspiring. Um, is there mentorship that you're advocating for um, personally and through your, through your business as well, for women specifically? For women specifically, what I do through my business is an apprenticeship program. Okay. You know, so I... Women um, who desire to work in the culinary field, you know, I employ them as apprentices and I train them. I teach them how to do everything we need to do. And I also pay them allowances, you know, and that has worked excellently. So I see them grow. You know, when someone comes to you and has no idea 
what techniques to use to move um, plain flour and butter and sugar, you know, to mix them together and form a cake, you know, something edible and delicious. Absolutely no idea. And you watch this person grow, grow to the extent that they begin to create their own stuff. They, they realize that, okay, if I reduce, you know, the math and science involved, it's like, okay, if I reduce this fly a little bit, you know, I could get it to be more fluffy and this. So I've surrounded myself in my workplace with such women. So they are apprentices. Some of them actually stay long-term. Some of them stay just two years and they move on, you know. So in that way, I have, you know, empowered women and on a personal note i have had a conversation with the women's society in my church and i've offered them a 75 percent discount on tuition so when they find a woman who desires to become a professional chef they bring her to me and then we train so yes those and some of the ways of trying to empower women. <laughs> I, I love it. Bravo, bravo. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm curious, and 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 thank you for indulging me for as long as we've been chatting. We've gone way over our time, but I'm just fascinated. Um, when, when I think about, or you think about the cultural aspects, and let's say the local flavors, of your culinary creations and what you produce at the school, how do you believe that your school and your work, McKay, is contributing to the overall culinary landscape in Nigeria? We are, we are very much work in progress. We are still growing, you know, but we continue to impact in the area of our school lunches because it's the same process that we, you know, we impute in our school lunches. And um, we do other, we do provide private catering as well, you know. So when close friends and family members have occasions like landmark celebrations, 50th birthday, 90th birthday, 80th birthday, those come to mind readily mm -hmm. or large receptions, we are asked to cook, you know. So we try to differentiate ourselves because there's a lot going on in, in Lagos, so to speak, you know, and um, our impact is such that we, we have people call us back over and over again. Oh, I had this meal there. Can you do this for me? Oh, I had this snack at such and such a place. Can you repeat the same to me? You know? So in that light, we, we are, gaining ground we are gaining ground and then for the school my word since this year opened we've received so many calls you know because we have a course starting off on the 12th of february you know and it's it's really encouraging seeing all of these people calling in like i said before it's it's been a blow up of the culinary industry in my country and people are eager now you know to become educated in that field you know and we ourselves are taking time to convince where is the word convince no to to put out the information that listen it's okay to be a culinary professional you don't have to be a doctor or a lawyer, you know. It's okay if your desire is to make good food for people. Come, we will train you, you know. I remember at the end of 2022, the Culinary Arts Practitioners Association in Nigeria, because we have that association, and we partnered with them. We, we, we actually sponsored an event, you know, where they brought a lot of high school children. We, it was, it was such an inspiring occasion. After I spoke to them and we shared with them how far we've come, two of those kids were so happy. They said they really want to become chefs, but 
they are afraid to broach the topic with their parents because mm -hmm. in Nigeria, <laughs> you are expected to just, you know, do something much more than become a chef, you know. But after that experience, they were confident enough, you know, said, yeah, so I can let my mom know that this is a recognized profession. This is an area where I can make my world on the, make my map on the world, you know. Beautifully said, beautifully said. Okay, we've come towards the end of our of our chat. It's been absolutely lovely. But before I let you go, the name of our podcast is The Ultimate Dish. So in your mind, and I'm going to try to, I, I think I know what your ultimate dish is, but I need you to explain it. Let's see if I can share screen here. Can you see that? Yes, I can this, see it. <laughs> this is your ultimate dish, and I have to know all of it, all of it. Okay, so if you had asked me two months ago what my ultimate dish is, I'll tell you right up, beans, beans, um, with stewed beans porridge with fried plantain. It's been my all-time favorite dish, okay? Uh -huh. But now, very recently, um, my doctor confirmed um, a diagnosis of pre-diabetes, um, pre okay? okay? So the past two months, I've had to go through a mindset change of how I see food and how I prepare food and what I eat, you know? So because I love beans and plantain so much, for me, this has become my ultimate dish. I've prepared it with the same white beans, the same ripe plantain. But what did I do? I decided to um, grill my ripe plantain instead. I grilled it until it became, it adopted the golden brown delicious color because it reminds me of the fried plantain. And I cooked my beans until it became tender and succulent. And I have my beans lying on top a bed of salsa, which I made with some green peppers, red peppers. And I infused the flavor profile I love so much which is the scotch bonnet pepper, some <laughs> crayfish, and wow. some dried catfish. So that's what I have oh. at the base. Yes. And then I decide to top it with same salsa and do a trail of <laughs> a trail of um Oh my goodness, it's not fermented, it's um pickled, a trail of pickled, pickled. onions. Yeah. Yes. yes, pickled yes. onion yes. and some pickled cucumbers. And it gave me the umami, the umami experience, I must say. I just love it. This this is a first. We've done a hundred episodes on the ultimate dish, but I've never heard a dish explain quite the way. You just explained yours with that much passion. Unbelievable, BK. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. And please Thank give you. my best to your to your husband when you get back. You and I will certainly stay in touch. And, you know, my best to your to your daughter and your grandchild. And thank you so much. Um, what a lovely, lovely conversation. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And I do hope um, you get better very quickly. I will. I will. I will. I think I got better in the last hour talking oh to you. I think I did. That's so nice to know. So nice. Thank you so much, Craig. Thank you for listening to the Ultimate Dish Podcast brought to you by Auguste Escoffier School of Culinary Arts. Visit escoffier.edu forward slash podcast, where you'll find any materials mentioned during the podcast, including notes, links, and other resources. You can also browse other episodes and subscribe.